Hi, I'm Sarah Shvirip and this video is going to be about preeclampsia. Preeclampsia refers to a disorder of pregnancy associated with high blood pressure. That is, a blood pressure above 14090 mm mercury, taken on two occasions at least four hours apart, and protein present in the urine. This is a multi-system disorder affecting multiple organs of the body. Now, before we go into the details of this disorder, we need to understand a bit more about the blood pressure changes during pregnancy. So, in a normal pregnancy, there is a physiological change in blood pressure which occurs, as we are going to see in this graph. So, we've got the axis here with blood pressure against gestation in weeks. And here we have the change in the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure. So as we can see over here, there's a dip in the blood pressure, reaching its minimum sometime during the second trimester. Then comes back to normal levels by the end of the third trimester. Now why does this happen? So to understand this, we need to remember an equation which we learned during our preclinical years. That is, blood pressure is the product of cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. It is the systemic vascular resistance which decreases at the beginning of pregnancy, due to systemic vasodilatation. So a low SVR results in a low blood pressure. And this explains our physiological dip in blood pressure during pregnancy. Okay, now when we identify high blood pressure in pregnancy, we need to classify what condition we are talking about. So essentially this depends on which stage of the pregnancy the patient is in. So if we identify high blood pressure before 20 weeks gestation, then this is classified as chronic hypertension. So the patient had high blood pressure irrespective of the pregnancy. However, if we find high blood pressure after 20 weeks gestation, first of all, we must check if she has protein in her urine, which is referred to as proteinuria. If there is no protein, then this is called gestational hypertension. But if protein is present, then this is preeclampsia. So essentially the difference between these two is that in gestational hypertension we have no systemic effects, while in preeclampsia this is a multi-system disease affecting multiple organs in the body. Okay, good. So now let us move on to understanding the pathophysiology of preeclampsia. What's going on exactly? So the exact cause of preeclampsia is still unclear, but what we do know is that it is secondary to the development of an abnormal placenta and specifically the development of the spiral arteries of the placenta. So during a normal pregnancy, the spiral artery arteries, as we can see over here, dilate to five times the original size. This dilatation allows for more blood flow in the placental bed, therefore delivering more oxygen and nutrients to the developing fetus. However, in preeclampsia, the spiral arteries become fibrous and do not dilate as much as a normal pregnancy, resulting in a poorly perfused placenta. This poorly perfused placenta starts to secrete pro-inflammatory factors, which get into the maternal circulation and have various effects on the maternal blood vessels, which I'm going to list over here. So, we've got vascular endothelial dysfunction, vasoconstriction, platelet activation and intravascular coagulation, and increased vascular permeability. These are all going to allow us to understand better the reason behind the presenting signs and symptoms of preeclampsia and also possible complications. So, let's start off with the first two. So essentially, these pro-inflammatory factors affect the endothelial cells lining the blood vessels, resulting in endothelial cell dysfunction, which in turn results in vasoconstriction of the blood vessels, limiting the blood flow to several organs in the body. So, first of all, vasoconstriction results in an increase in the blood pressure, resulting in hypertension. Next, a limited blood flow to the kidneys may damage glomeruli, resulting in oliguria and proteinuria, which, like we said, is one of the defining features of preeclampsia. So, if kidney damage has set in, we might also identify a raised urea and creatinine. Next, limited blood flow to the retina may cause blurred vision, and limited blood flow to the liver may result in liver failure or rupture, and these patients may present with epigastric or right upper quadrant pain as well as deranged LFTs. Okay, next, so the endothelial cell dysfunction we mentioned previously 
also results in the development of small thrombi within the blood vessels. The formation of thrombi uses up a lot of platelets. The thrombi within the blood vessels also results in hemolysis, as many red blood cells are destroyed as they hit the thrombi. And this is essentially the basis of HELP syndrome, where we've got hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. Finally, endothelial cell dysfunction also results in increased vascular permeability, where more fluid is allowed to escape the blood vessels into the tissues, resulting in generalized edema in the legs and face, in pulmonary edema, and cerebral edema. Great, so now that we have an idea on what preeclampsia is all about, we can begin to understand the clinical findings and the complications associated with this condition. So let us have a look at the clinical signs here. So essentially, we have already identified that we have a patient beyond 20 weeks gestation. She has presented with high blood pressure over 140190. And she has proteinuria on her urine on dipstick testing. Next, we want to assess her symptoms. So sometimes patients with preeclampsia might be completely asymptomatic. However, they may also present with symptoms such as headaches, visual disturbances, epigastric and right upper quadrant pain, swelling in the legs and face. They might also present with confusion, with nausea and vomiting, and hyperreflexia and clonus may be elicited on examination. Now, moving on to the complications. So this disease affects both the mother and the fetus, therefore resulting in both maternal and fetal complications. So we're going to start off with the maternal complications first. And first up, we have eclampsia. Eclampsia is when the mother develops seizures secondary to the preeclampsia effects on the brain. Other complications include stroke, renal failure, liver failure or rupture, HELP syndrome, disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC, operative delivery, and death. Now, the fetal complications include intrauterine growth restriction, and this is because of the reduced blood flow to the placenta and therefore to the fetus, limiting growth, placental abruption, premature birth, and perinatal death. Okay, so next, what investigations do we need to take? So first of all, we need to identify proteinuria and we need to quantify it. So first we perform a urine dipstick test to check if there is proteinuria or not. Then we quantify it by means of a urine protein creatinine ratio, which needs to be more than 30 milligrams per millimole. Or by performing a 24 hour urine collection, which needs to be more than 200 milligrams in 24 hours. Next, we need to assess for any maternal complications. So here we take some blood tests, including UNEs and uric acid, to check for renal complications. We take platelets, checking for HELP syndrome, and we check LFTs, checking for any liver damage. We also take an INR and APTT to check for any coagulation problems. Then we need to assess for any fetal complications. So we perform an ultrasound growth to check the size of the baby, because as we said, there is a risk of intrauterine growth restriction. We also check the umbilical artery Doppler. Now, essentially, this is measuring the velocity waveform of the umbilical arteries. If this identifies a lot of resistance within the circulation, then not enough blood is getting to the placenta. And therefore, we are essentially quantifying how poorly perfused the placenta actually is. If we are concerned about fetal well-being, we can also perform a CTG. Great, now before we move on to the management, let's quickly go through the risk factors for preeclampsia. So we've got previous hypertension in pregnancy, chronic hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, autoimmune disease such as SLE and antiphospholipid syndrome. We've also got naliparity, age over 40 years, a pregnancy interval of more than 10 years, a BMI greater than 35, a family history of preeclampsia, and a multifetal pregnancy. Now, an important thing to mention here is that in high-risk pregnancies with multiple risk factors for preeclampsia, 
aspirin can be started as a form of prevention. And this is given as either 75 or 150 milligrams daily. Perfect. Now, lastly, we're going to discuss the management of preeclampsia. Now, the ultimate cure for preeclampsia is delivery, getting rid of the placenta, essentially. But in the meantime, we need to control the blood pressure to avoid the complications associated with preeclampsia. So we need to give antihypertensives in order to maintain the blood pressure below 140 So drugs which are safe to use in pregnancy include labetalol, which we start at around 100 mg BD, and nifedipine, where we can either give a 10 mg stat dose to control the blood pressure acutely, or else we can give 20 mg BD of the slow-release formulation as a regular dose. Now, like we said, antihypertensives merely control the blood pressure. They do not cure the disease. So as part of the management of preeclampsia, we need to constantly be on the lookout for maternal and fetal complications. And if severe disease is identified, then early delivery should be considered. Now, in cases of severe preeclampsia, we also give magnesium sulfate for treatment and prevention of eclampsia, as it acts as a form of neuroprotection. If early delivery is being considered, we also give dexamethasone, which is a steroid used to promote fetal lung maturity. It is given in two doses of 12 milligrams, 12 hours apart. Great. So I really hope that this video was helpful. Thank you.